testing, testing. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to welcome you to the first of many forums and conferences that we're going to have in the community of Bronzeville. We are honored today to start our first forum, which is the Alzheimer's and Dementia One Conference. We have had an opportunity before to have speakers and stuff, but today is going to be phenomenal. I'd like to introduce you to our first speaker, uh, Chuck Benet, Benet, excuse me, XLRX Pharmacy. Then we have Dr. Brian Regatta. Regatta, okay. And then we have two outstanding ladies. They call the Dementia Raw Sisters, okay. And they talk about dementia. There's a gentleman I'm going to have come up also. Great Lakes, would you come up please and join us today? I guess. Okay, I heard that. We had another party who was supposed to attend, but she's not here. So I'd like to make sure we get a chance to meet some outstanding folks. You also have vendors today that are to your left. You have the Chicago uh, Diabetes Project. You have Blue Cross and Blue Shield. You have Citywide Healthcare, and you have XR Pharmacy Home Delivery Service. I'd like to start out with thanking you first for coming today, taking out of your busy schedule to come and join us. We're glad to have you. I'd like to start out with reading the bios, please. First will be Charles Benet. Benin. Benin, I got it right. Oh, okay. Is a leader in the Illinois pharmacy industry who has managed, founded, and operated long-term care companies across the state and region. A licensed Illinois registered pharmacist, Charles is currently partner and chief operating officer of United XR, a long-term care pharmacy that serves over 10,000 beds across Illinois, XL, XL RX, Indiana, Missouri, and Ohio. I'm a little nervous, guys. Please excuse me. Prior to funding United RX, Charles served as president of the Ryerson Healthcare, where he operated a long-term care pharmacy that served 800 skilled beds in the northern Illinois market. The company later merged with United Scripps Villa Park, which became United RX in 2010. As an entrepreneur, Charles has owned and operated a number of Illinois retail pharmacies, including the Ryerson Pharmacy, Midway Pharmacy, Thornton Pharmacy, and C&P Pharmacy, Rosella, Illinois. I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce to our second speaker, Dr. Brian Rogata. Interested in specializing in geriatrics, created in the Geriatric Fellowship at Loyola Medical Center. Dr. Rogata is currently practicing geriatrics care with the Page Medical Group. And the two ladies that we have sitting next to us is Tammy and Kathy, and they're with Dementia Raw. Get that, Dementia Raw. Think about that one. And then you have a gentleman sitting in there, his name is Dean. Dean is a person that I just met, but I'm glad to have, he's doing uh, Lake Trials, is that correct? Trials. Medical trials, okay. That is our group. Uh, like I said, I'm a little nervous. Please excuse me. Uh, I do apologize for that. I'd like to start with Chuck first. I can't believe you're nervous. You're always in front of crowds here. Well, I, I appreciate you all for making it out here today. And it's, like she said, it is the first of many of these uh, meetings that we'd like to inform 
the residents, the caregivers of uh, the seniors in this community and many communities throughout the Chicagoland area, of things that affect people you know. Everybody in here must know someone who has Alzheimer's or dementia. And so we feel that it's of great importance to talk about how it affects your lives, how things develop, the stages of Alzheimer's, the stages of dementia, the medications that treat these diseases, what ancillary products might be necessary for these disease states and for the caregivers to know about. And I think uh, the, the people on this stage all have a very specific knowledge on these disease states. And so I will now give the microphone over to Dr. Brian Ragona and let him talk about Alzheimer's and dementia. Uh, there's, a, there's a quick three minute video that I think we'd like to show first and it kind of gives an overview of why we're doing what we're doing. So um, before, we, before we bring Brian up, uh, Dr. Ragona up, we'll, we'll talk about, uh, we'll show the video. Here you go. When Joe was diagnosed with um, Alzheimer's or dementia, we wanted to find out as much as we could about this disease and what we could do to be as proactive as possible. African Americans particularly are a culture that does it for ourselves. Consequently, we won't necessarily seek the information. We won't necessarily ask for help. We suffer in silence, which isn't good for the patient nor the caregiver. The first thing you have to do in order to fight anything is to educate yourself. And I just said, Joe, we're going to find out as much as we can about this. African American population is affected by Alzheimer's disease two times greater than the general population. The Hispanic population is affected one and a half times greater than, than the general population. And so absolutely, uh, we need to connect to African Americans in our community at a much greater rate than what we're doing today. The tendency on the part of African Americans in general is to shy away from particularly research. Uh, because of some historical things, uh, such as the experiment, the Tuskegee experiment, and a list of things that go on, and so there is a trust issue. You can stumble around in this morass of confusion and fear and, and, and exhaustion for a long, long time, you know, but if it is a resource there to help you with simple answers to very complex questions, in some segments of the African-American community, memory loss is considered part of normal aging. It is not, but it is accepted. So people tend not to seek help until the more advanced stages. We are serving across the nation about 10% of those impacted by the disease. And that's just not enough. It's simply not enough. So you think about 90% are out there struggling on their own. It really is a journey that requires planning for in so many different ways. Who's going to have power of attorney? Who's going to be the primary caregiver here? Is the overriding goal for us is to get more people connected to the Alzheimer's Association, whether it's through the helpline or through our website, so that we connect them to the services that are out there. Let your tears flow, but still come and get involved. The more knowledge you have, the more time you have to build memories and make memories and take pictures and discuss and travel. They're not dead, they're still there. Well, I like music, uh, period, but uh, I like jazz. He is a collector. We've got like, what, 10,000 plus albums? I don't think it's that bad. It may be only 95. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a good life, if, you know, even with the uh, uh, issues it has to do with been able to do things at a relatively high level and, uh, and sometimes I remember those things. <laughs> you can't do this alone. You cannot do this alone. And so it's back again to the whole issue of the crisis. Respond before there is a crisis. Because if you don't take care of yourself, 
then you're taking away the dependency and security that your loved one has. What's that run? <laughs> Pick up that 24-7 number and call. It's all there for you. There's no need to feel alone. Can you people hear me? I don't use the microphone. Yeah. Oh. A little bit. You want me to use the microphone? Yes. Okay. The only reason I asked is I'm of Italian extraction. I've got both hands completely pulled out, so I'm going to throw the microphone on. Uh, as, first off, I'd like to thank CellRx uh, for asking me here. And Alzheimer's disease, as, as Mr. Benet, put it, affects everybody closely. It affects my family. My mother has Alzheimer's disease. Uh, it affects the vast majority of people in this country. As a way and a means of telling you what Alzheimer's disease is, uh, Alzheimer's disease is a classification of dementia. And dementia is a broad term that basically means memory loss. And what we talk about in terms of memory loss is memory loss that is pathologic. It's not memory loss where you lose your keys or forget where you put your pen. It's memory loss where you forget where you live. It's memory loss where you go out and wander because you can't find your way back home and die of exposure. It's memory loss where a patient of mine went out to the grocery store and was picked up in Ohio. My practice is in Joliet. He got on I-80 and didn't get off I-80 until the Ohio State Patrol stopped him and they had to escort him back to Illinois. He hadn't broken any laws, but he ended up in Ohio. And I have had patients set their homes on fire because of memory loss. They forget to turn the stoves off. That's late Alzheimer's disease. And in late Alzheimer's disease, we find a significant impairment of daily life activities. Uh, daily life activities are things like bathing, dressing, caring for yourself, caring for others, things that we do without thinking about them. That's late dementia, Alzheimer's for other. The cause of Alzheimer's disease has been postulated to be a deposition of a particular protein or substance in the brain. And that particular substance causes an inflammatory response. If any of you have rheumatoid arthritis, or better yet, if any of you have had a burn, or a cold, or pneumonia, the symptoms that you get from those issues are inflammatory responses that your body makes to fight off whatever it is that's causing the inflammatory issue. Alzheimer's disease or dementia is postulated to be caused by the deposition of these proteins in the brain which causes your body to think there's something foreign going on and it reacts to that foreign entity by creating inflammation. That inflammation subsequently causes the brain substance to break down. And this inflammation goes on insidiously. So it starts and progresses insidiously until we no longer have the ability to participate in our own activities of daily life. We come, become dependent on other people to oversight us so we don't end up in Ohio when we go out for 
dinner or go out to the grocery store. And more importantly, we don't end up dying because we forget to go back in the house. The symptoms, memory loss, difficulty communication, decline in the ability to pay attention, no reasoning, difficult judgment. They can't, they have a different way of, of vision. Sensory loss, take loss of taste, symptoms, these symptoms are progressive. What we mean in terms of loss of taste, sensory loss, this stuff is really forgetfulness. We don't lose it, we forget we have it. Visual perception is forgetfulness. We don't have a perception differentiation. We forget what it is that we're seeing. We can't identify it. Reasoning and judgment, again, you forget how to judge. You forget how to reason. You can't focus, you can't pay attention. Now, you forget how to pay attention. You don't know you need to pay attention. Language deficit deficiencies, we forget how to talk. Memory loss covers the entire spectrum. Memory loss, in medical terms, is called dementia. There are a plethora of types of dementia. In my practice, we diagnose somebody with dementia, and then we go about trying to figure out what kind of dementia they have. The reason we do that is there are several correctable kinds of dementia. And there are several types of dementia that if the inciting issues are treated, we can stop that dementia from going forth. Correctable causes, correctable dementias, include things like hypothyroidism, underactive thyroids. Include things like collagen vascular diseases, which are those diseases where your body doesn't know itself and acts against itself, like rheumatoid arthritis. Correctable dimensions, dementias include things like neurosyphilis, which is treated simply by giving somebody antibiotics. B12 deficiency, vitamin deficiency, which we give you back the vitamins and your dementia lifts. So we go through this litany of tests looking for the needle in the haystack, so to speak. The vast majority of these dementias are, the mass, I'm sorry, the vast majority of dementias that we see are not treatable. I've been practicing medicine in geriatrics for about 33 years. And in 33 years, I've seen thousands, if not tens of thousands of patients. And one of the most significant disease processes I see on a daily basis is dementia. On a daily basis, I look for those causes. In 10 years, having seen tens of thousands of patients, multiple dementia cases, I can count on one hand the number that we've been able to fix by giving them penicillin or giving them vitamin B12 or changing their thyroid medicine. So I, I, I don't want to hold out false hope that dementias are fixable, but unless you look, you can't find them. The majority of dementias are dementias of Alzheimer's type. Alzheimer's is just a name associated with a dementia. It isn't a medical term. So we, in, in the profession, say that somebody suffers from a dementia of Alzheimer's type meaning there's no correctable cause. Dementia, if you look at functioning of the brain, you can tell that dementia impacts the brain's function by that amplification of inflammation and destruction of brain tissue. Normal brain, un abnormal brain in the same area. These are what are called functional MRI pictures. So, part and parcel of the research of dementia was formulating this look at the brain with functional MRIs, defining that there was something in the brain 
that was causing a loss of function. Eventually, we came to know that to be these, pro these proteins and this inflammatory response. Currently, the most research being done on Alzheimer's type dementia revolves around sequestration or limiting these proteins from getting into the brain themselves and subsequently avoiding the inflammation that results in the loss of an ability to remember and subsequently all of the cascade that loss of memory causes. We don't use one test to diagnose this. We use a sundry of tests. I talked to a couple of people this morning and I said I have my own test to diagnose dementia. And, and that's what I think of as the introductory test. When I walk into a room, I can almost guess if there's an elderly patient in the room and that elderly patient in the room was brought there by one of their loved ones, usually the daughter, because for whatever reason, sons don't bring their elderly patient mothers and fathers to me. I usually see the daughter. And I introduce myself to both of them. I walk up, I say, hi, I'm Dr. Ragona. Can you tell me what you're here for? And inevitably, that loved one starts with, there's something wrong with mom or dad. And the question then comes, what's wrong with mom or dad? And the answer usually is something like, they seem to be having problems eating. They don't seem to want to eat anymore, but they don't complain of anything. They don't seem to want to take care of themselves anymore, but they don't complain of anything. And inevitably, as soon as that family member starts talking, the patient starts arguing. The patient says, no, I'm perfectly okay. My daughter just doesn't understand me. No, I eat fine. I just don't eat much because I'm concerned that I'll gain weight. No, I don't fall asleep early. I fall asleep to take a nap because I want to watch Jimmy Fallon at night. And then I say, oh, well, 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 that's really interesting. And I ask him a couple of questions. And then I say, excuse me, but I just want to make sure, did I introduce myself when I came in the room? And inevitably, that loved one will say, yes. And then I'll turn to the patient and I say, did you hear me do that? And the patient will say, yes, you said you're a doctor. And I said, well, did I tell you my name? And they'll have this perplexed look on their face, and they're diagnosed. That's as easy as it gets. Now, I can go through this litany of medical history, medical exam, laboratory tests, report on day-to-day -day functionality, changes in personality. I certainly do that. But that little introductory issue, that little three-minute snippet, just about closes the door on the diagnosis. The rest of this stuff supports what I just made the diagnosis of. Once we make the diagnosis, and the diagnosis is a litany of stuff, probably the most important part of that is not my little snippet, but something called a mini mental status exam, which is a 20 to 30 point scoring exam that we can take and give people in about five minutes. It involves various tasks that are rudimentary. Uh, count backwards from 100 by sevens, remember three objects, draw a clock, draw intersecting figures. All different tests for different parts of the brain that people will be able to do if they have no issues. And we score that test on a 30-point scoring system, and normal would be 25 to 30. Abnormal is anything under 25. Abnormal is anything under 25, meaning you don't have very good memory. The memory is then scored as to whether it's early, middle, or moderate, or late, or severe. And early dementia is anybody who scores 24 to 18 or 19. Moderate someone who scores 18 or 19 to around 14. 
and late is anybody who scores 14 or lower. All this tells us is that, yes, indeed, they have a memory dysfunction, and it gives us a place on a, on a line or a graph as to where they sit. That's important because there's no cure for this disease. There's really no treatment for the disease. Unlike high blood pressure, unlike diabetes, unlike pneumonia, unlike heart disease, that we can go fix something, we can't fix your brain at this point. There are no therapies to alleviate any of these symptoms. There's no prevention. There's no getting out of the way of this thing. There are a couple of disease mitigating drugs that may slow the progression of the disease, but really this disease is onward and onward and downward. There are several ways the disease progresses. There is a insidious downward slide, and some people will know that. They'll say, mom's been having problems for years. And we just have been seeing this for years, but we just got to the point where she just doesn't, she's just not able to help herself at home and we'd like to know what's going on. There's another type of progression called stair-stepping, where a patient looks really good and then has a big downward trend and then flattens out. Gee, I thought mom was doing well, but she quit dressing herself. But that's all that's going on. She just quit dressing herself. And we've been helping her. And she's been doing well for, for four or five months. We didn't, we, then all of a sudden she, she quit eating. And she did really well for a year, and now she's getting lost. That's stair-stepping. It's probably the nicest progression because it's the slowest progression. And then there's the profound decline basically falling off a cliff. You're normal one day, and within a month, you're completely dependent on all other caregivers. They're all dementia. They're all forgetfulness. How do you get these things is usually involved in your genetic code. What can we do to help people with dementia? Well, we use certain medications if we want to forestall the progression of any of these dementias that are forestallable. And the medications basically move you out on the curve in such a fashion that it delays where you're going to be in 18 months to where you are today. It buys you 18 months of where you are today before you actually start to progress. It's kind of like cancer therapy. Without a cancer therapy, you may die in six months. With a cancer therapy, you may live for two years. Most people will opt for the two years. Some patients don't opt for that. Some families don't opt for that. What can we do as well? Well, we can help with exercise, we can manage diet, we can tell them to stop smoking, we can manage their weight. I think the most important thing that we should do is make sure they're communally intact. Make sure they have access to other people. My mom, who has dementia, moved into a senior living facility about four years ago. And my mother, prior to moving into that senior living facility, basically stared out into space and did nothing. She and my father lived together in their home in Addison. And my father would get up and go in the basement, my mother would stay upstairs, and I basically told my sister that my mom is getting treated like a goldfish by my father, and that is they got together to eat, and then they ignored each other. And it got to a point where my dad was 90, 
my mom was 83, and we said, well, it's too dangerous for them to stay in their house, we're moving them. And to move somebody who's survived the Depression in World War II is a task unto itself. To move someone who's survived the Depression in World War II, who doesn't think there's anything wrong with them, is almost impossible. In our case, it required a significant amount of duct tape and handcuffs. <laughs> Nonetheless, we took them down, we put them in an assisted living facility, which my father hated because it was not his house that he swore he would never leave. But within six months, my mother was entirely different. So different, in fact, that my kids and my nieces and nephews would look at us and say, what happened to Nana? She's back again. And I said, well, where did she go? I said, no, 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 she's actually acting like she did six years ago. And that's because she was in a social environment. She had other people to talk to. It, it actually revved up her ability to bring what function she had back to the surface. She went from late dementia to moderate dementia and has been at moderate dementia for three or four years. She's probably in that stair-stepping kind of dementia. When you speak to her at this point in time, which I do infrequently, even though she lives half a mile to a mile from where my office is, I hardly ever get a chance to get over there, but when you speak to her, she's the first one to tell you, I don't remember certain things in my life. She doesn't have memory for living in Addison for 21 years. But she says, you know what? That's okay. I probably don't need those memories anyway. So she lives in the moment. The thing that helped her the most was the communal activities that people have. And as I understand it, we have multiple communal entities in the room. You're listening to a talk on a memory problem. If there's something that you can take away from this, it's that this disease is incurable. The disease has some treatments available through medical intervention that help forestall progression. The disease has treatments that are really beneficial and it involves your community and your community around the patient. The problem that we have is most families don't want to admit that this exists. Most patients don't want to admit that this exists. They get angry or they get, they retract it to themselves. If you see that happening, get the diagnosis and then get the people involved in community activity. It's really concerning given, given the fact that where we are now, African Americans are twice as likely to be diagnosed with a late stage dementia compared to Caucasians. Now that's late stage dementia. And there's a couple of prob problems with that statistic. The statistic sort of says that the reason African Americans don't get diagnosed earlier is that they don't go to the doctor or don't have adequate health care to go to the doctor and only get diagnosed in late stage dementia when something terrible befalls them. They get lost, they get hurt, somebody takes advantage of them, they get scammed by someone, all of a sudden something terrible happens. And it's on us as, as family members to make sure that our, our family members are well treated, are taken care of, are not taken advantage of. So if mom, dad, sister, brother, aunt, uncle have issues that they deny they have, they have issues. And they need some kind of input for those issues. They need to go see somebody to find out why they have the issues. And maybe with God's good grace, they have something that we can fix or that we can treat 
or that we can tell you to turn to the community for help. These little plaques, this is, we're just going to buzz through some of these. This, this is the little proteins that destroy, this is a nerve that get in here and destroy the nerve itself. We talked about stages, we talked about decline, we talked about behavior. Uh, these are different ways of acting out. We talked about everything except delusions and paranoia, but that's when patients become argumentative. The delusions usually are, my family hates me and they're after me. They're stealing from me. Or impulsive behavior. Someone called on the phone and said they're from a charity and can you please give us some money and you go to your vault and you take out $50 or $100 or God forbid $1,000 and you hand it over to this scam artist. Severe dementia is what we see in patients who are completely dependent on a caregiver. They can't eat, they can't drink, they don't feed themselves because they can't remember that they're supposed to. You put a tray of food in, uh, a tray of food in front of them and they don't eat it because they think they've already ate it. And it's kind of hard to wrap your, wrap your head around that concept that you can actually forget that you've eaten with food right in front of you. But that's the disease. You forget. You can't take care of yourself because you forget you need to. Or you think you did, but forget you did. These are for patients who don't have late dementia. These are patients who are probably moderate dementia or who have a certain degree of incontinence. They forget they need to go to the bathroom. They become incontinent. They forget to eat. They become malnourished. They go to the bathroom, slip and fall because they don't remember that it's wet, that they shouldn't be in the bathroom themselves. ExcelRx wants to work hand in hand with us, the docs, as well as other healthcare providers to provide an effective way of managing this dementia. Mr. Benane has been gracious enough to invite me to talk to you today about dementia. I thank him, thank him because it's one of the things I deal with in my practice every day. And it's, it's, it's quite disconcerting that it's one of the things that we're supposed to know a lot about and be able to fix, and yet our fix is really communal. It's really the community that needs to help us fix this. That's about all I can talk to you about. Do any of you have any questions that you might want to ask regarding this thing? Yes, ma'am. I have an we have the same model that we have different models. Okay. And I noticed that my sister can go all the way back in her life and tell me about days and times and things that happened in her life. But yet I can't remember things okay. from my past. Oh, okay. And so, and then I have a sister to be a younger woman, and we have the same problem. And I noticed me and her have the same issue. Days in the event, you can tell you something about it in my life. If someone asks us about dating stuff, we don't remember. Like, I couldn't people come in, I couldn't remember. When my mother passed away, the love of the world, I couldn't even date. Well, nothing like that. But my sister, she would come and say, Mama, we passed in 74. Oh, my like, is she? So, are you concerned that that's part of a memory issue that you yeah. might have? Yeah, I, 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 can, I can have a train of thought of something I'm going to say. And it's, if I'm saying something, then someone, you know, kind of interrupts. It's like I forget. When you come back to me, finish you know what I'm saying. It's like I forgot what I was going to say. That's not dimension. <laughs> 
could suffer from this. I was going to say, I, I do the same thing. My wife remembers all the words. Would you repeat that, please? I, I said what, what she's concerned about is that she, her sister, has long-term memory that's better than hers. And, and she was wondering if she has a form of dementia, and the answer is no. And we couldn't hear you. No, I was saying that my 84 year old sister. No, you. You said something about yourself. During the conversation. Oh, wait. When I, I have a sister, children are younger than me. And I noticed when her and I be conversating with each other, both of us forget forget events in our lives. And I'd be saying, hey, you remember that happened such and such time? And then she'll say, no. Or if she say something to me about an event that happened, she'll say, you remember that. And such and such. I said, no, I don't okay. remember. So I get, I get lost in dates and, and stuff and I don't even know that she don't even know. So my sister can tell us a story and, and she, it's almost we can, she can put you in that story because she remembers so well at her age. She lives alone, she takes care of herself, she feeds herself, she bathes herself, she dresses herself, she walks her dog, she, she takes care of her house, she keeps it clean, and I'm like, I hope the Lord blessed me to be that way, that be able and continue to be independent on myself. Well, first off, you don't have dementia. Thank you. <laughs> because if you did, you couldn't tell me what your sister was able to do. Now, now my wife, as a, as a way of, of, of showing you what I mean, my wife tells me that I have this uncanny ability to remember what I ate at what restaurant 20 years ago. And, and Mr. Mr. Benane calls me a golf savant because he and I do play golf on occasion and I actually have to direct him where to drive the cart on golf courses that I've played that he may not have and he wonders how I do this because I may not have played that golf course in seven years. But that's not a memory function problem. That's just something in my DNA that makes me able to remember that kind of stuff. And if I do something really stupid, which I usually do on a daily basis, according to my wife, she usually can remember that 10 years down the road when I do the same thing that was stupid, just to bring it up and discuss it. And inevitably, for her, it's a discussion for me, it's a beating. Brian, let's, we've got a question over here. Yes, I have two. Well, I have two One, I want to go back to where you talked about use language. I wanted to go back to where you talked about uh, taking a test uh, to, to see if, to stop the dementia. You were talking about uh, deficiency vitamins or your thyroid. You said if you did the test, that you say you could you may be able to stop the dementia from happening? Because once you get the disease, it's no stop. So did you would you comment on that more when you was talking about taking the test uh, for deficiencies in your body, which may be the vitamins or maybe the thyroid? The other one I wanted to, to ask about was uh, and I forgot. Oh <laughs> I know. Um, why is it that someone who does have dementia can talk about things in their past, in their life, in their childhood, uh, that they can remember so vividly when they were young? And just like they said, we can't remember some things. But when you get dementia, you can talk about that so vividly. You can see things in your childhood. Why is that? But you, when, when you, but in the present, you can't remember. Right, right. Uh, first off, the tests that we do are to find the different, to find a different kind of dementia than Alzheimer's type dementia. So we're looking for something that we can fix. And that doesn't happen very often. It happens probably less than 2% of the time that there's actually something there that we can fix. So we don't do the tests to diagnose dementia. We do the tests 
to see if the dementia I already know you have has some reason that I can give you thyroid medicine or B12 or whatever and your memory will get better. The other question is why can patients with dementia remember things in the past but can't remember things recently? And the, and the reason for that is the part of dementia that we know starts in the area of your brain that involves reasoning and learning. And that area of your brain is the first part of it that goes. Distant memories are an entirely different area of your brain which tends to have a longer lasting effect. Now, if you take patients who have profound late dementia, they can't talk about anything. So, yeah, if, if someone has dementia and can remember back when they were kids or when they were, you know, the start of World War II or what have you, that's perfectly appropriate because that part of their brain hasn't been affected yet. It will be. It just hasn't got there yet. Let me say one thing. I want to make sure that everybody understands. That's, excuse me, that's why it's so, I gotta think about that. <laughs> that it's important that we spread the word in this community. This room should have been packed. There were over 125 people that registered. No excuses. And you know I've been in this community for years. And every time I put on an event like this, I give you valuable, information and education that you need. Now, next time I do this, I want you to tell everybody, bring somebody. Let's not let our community lack in this. We don't know nothing about dementia and Alzheimer's. My mother had Alzheimer's. I didn't know nothing about it. But this is an opportunity. You have specialists here today. You have Chuck who's Rx. You need to get in contact with these folks. You have a doctor over here. Now I have other speakers. I don't want to hold you all all day. What I'd like you to do is let the other speakers speak. Then we're going to come back and ask some more questions, okay? We'll have a period where you can just ask nothing but questions. I want to make sure that we get through the whole form, okay? There's someone, drivers, uh, wait a minute. A gray Mitsubishi. A gray car is outside. Two nine seven seven three nine. The security person is right there. He needs to see you. Okay. <laughs> Doc, would you ask her that last question? And then what we're going to do is we're going to go on to our next two groups, and then we're going to come back. And then what I want you to do is take some time and talk to everybody. There are other people got we got a lot of questions here for you, okay? And I just don't want I don't I don't want to pass up anybody, okay? I, that's no problem. What was the last question? I forgot. <laughs> Pardon me. I finished it. All right. Th thank you guys for. Okay, young lady. <laughs> I'm at the risk of getting crucified, go ahead and ask the question. <laughs> what I would like to know, what age is, what age do we get to dementia? What age is? What age is uh, when you get dementia? You can get dementia at any age. Oh, at any age. I mean, there are certain early onset dementias that we see that are Alzheimer's-like. Those patients get, get, start to have forgetfulness in their 50s and their 40s. And there's late onset, where you don't see anybody having issues until they're 80. Is this due to the brain? Was the cell in the brain? It's due to the genetics that you have, and when your genetic code starts programming this type of protein that ends up in your brain that causes the inflammation. So it's not really a problem with the brain itself, it's a problem with your genetics. And then it becomes a problem with when your genetics flip that switch to start making this stuff that ends up in your brain.
Well, they, my, they, they died during those low stages of my mother and father and stuff. That's what I want to know. When do you when, when is it? When do you to this? It spreads itself around pretty liberally. So what we're going to do, we're going to go on to our next speaker. Then we're going to have a speaker, a time when you can ask all the questions that you want, okay? So I suggest that you get a piece of paper. If you look in your, if you look in your bag, you will see paper. Write down your questions so you'll be able to ask questions of all of our speakers, okay? Doc, I want to thank you so very much. We, we need you to come back again and do this another time as well because you have not hit all the community yet. Okay, now I'd like to introduce you to Kathy and Tamara. They're the Mitchell twins. It's the, it's the Mitchell Rock. More than likely, we don't need the microphone. Can, as, can everybody hear us? Yeah. We project very well. <laughs> well, first of all, I want to thank everyone for having us here. Christine, thank you so much. Um, Dr. Ragona did a fabulous job in really explaining what dementia is like. Kind of gave you the background, all the, the medical stuff that you really need to know. Do you need to hear my mic? So. Oh, there we go. So, thank you so much for sharing all that information. He shared with you a lot about the medical background of what's going on in your brain when, it, when, it, when we're dealing with dementia. What Kathy and I really excel at is really helping caregivers, loved ones, professional, family members, understand how to communicate in the best way possible with a person with dementia. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna uh, talk a little bit about what that looks like, and we're gonna do that by telling a story first. Kathy has a wonderful story about a resident that she used to take care of years ago. So um, probably about 15 years ago, I took care of a resident by the name of Dolly. And I worked on a third floor memory care unit. It was a locked unit, so there were no buttons for the elevator, it was just a key. And she would go up to the keyhole every afternoon about 3 or 4 o'clock and she'd sit there and just incessantly press this key button. Well, nothing was happening. The nurses were in the, at the nurse's station charting and this was happening every single day and no one could seem to get her away from the elevator and we were feared for her safety. So I approached Dolly one day and I said, Dolly, what's going on? And she said, I'm waiting for my mom to come pick me up. She always comes and gets me after work. Well, I knew that wasn't happening. But there was no reason for me to tell Dolly that. My job was to enter into her reality. So I said, Dolly, we sit right over here on these chairs when we want to wait and see if someone's coming to visit us from the, off the elevator. Why don't I sit with you so we can see anybody, any visitor that gets off the elevator? So she willingly went with me. And we sat down. And then I entered into her reality, and instead of steering her away from what she was thinking about, I entered into it with her. And I said, Dolly, you mentioned your mom and work. What did your mom used to do? And Dolly said to me, well, she works at a bakery. She would bring home the day old bread and the old donuts because they'd have to throw them away otherwise. And I'd get to share them with my friends, and I loved the way it smelled. And I sat down with Dolly as we were sitting together and I said, I used to work at a bakery when I was in high school. I was the donut lady. That's how I made a ton of friends. I told her how my car smelled like sprinkles and chocolate. She and I reminisced about the smells of the bakery, about how her mom would pick her up at the end of a shift. And for about five minutes, we had this wonderful, meaningful moment in conversation where I delved into where she was and we reminisced. And after that, she kind of calmed down, her anxiety decreased, and she stopped looking at the elevator every couple seconds. And I said, Dolly, you know, it's getting time for me to set the table for dinner, and I need someone to pass the napkins. Do you mind coming with me now? Because I had built that trust with her by entering into her reality, she was willing to go with me, and she did. We went to the dining room, and she helped me set the table. We did this almost every day. And sometimes the story varied. Sometimes she told me more about mom's bakery. Sometimes she told me more about mom picking her up after school. But regardless, we always, I always entered into her reality. And what I was doing without knowing it 
is I was using the rules of improv to communicate with her. I did not need a large manual. I did not need to run to her chart. I didn't have to have any education level of anything higher than maybe fifth grade to understand. What I had to have was the empathy and the ability to enter into her world and know that it was my job to be an empty vessel. It was my job to make her look good, rule number two. It was my job to find the gifts in conversation that she was giving us. And it was my job to yes and her conversation. Okay, so Kathy real quickly gave you four rules in which you need to utilize to be able to communicate with a person with dementia. The very first rule that you talked about was being an empty vessel. So what that means is when we go in to communicate with a person with, uh, with dementia, the first thing we need to do is whatever agenda we have inside, and we know we have an agenda, don't we? We always do. Take it, set aside, be one and be Zen-like, be with that person, be in that moment with that person, and listen to where they're at. As soon as we can do that, we're able to connect with them, okay? Number two was to make your partner look good. Now, if we look at the Dolly story, there was a lot of potential for Kathy to really make Dolly look bad by saying things like, don't you remember? Oh, come on, your mom's dead. I mean, those are pathways to really creating a really horrible situation. Instead, she listened to Dolly, realized that she was missing someone, and was able to sit down with her and start communicating with her. So we took our agenda away, and she also took away the ability of making Dolly look bad. She looked at how can I make Dolly look good, and she did that and feel good, feel good about herself. And then the third one is looking for the gifts. This is one of my favorite things because oftentimes when we're working with someone in community, if we're in an assisted living or memory care community, we instantly kind of freeze up in our conversations with people and we don't realize that every time we're working with a person with dementia, they're consistently giving you a gift. So in this situation, she talked about her mom. She was able to have a conversation with her by asking her, what did your mom do? And then she was able to have that conversation. Because when we're working with a person with dementia, they are able to hold on to that long-term memory, but that short-term memory is what we're missing. So we're able to really leverage that long-term memory by maybe somebody misses home. Home is a great one. We've got 50 things that we can use for home. We can talk about the people that lived in the home, the city, the state. What did your home look like? What was your favorite thing about home? Your favorite room? Did you have a great blanket? You know, did you sit by the fire at night? There's so many things that we can leverage to really be able to have really great peak moments of success with the person with dementia. And then our last rule of improv, which is one of the best rules ever. If, this, if you take it, only one thing away from us today, take this rule with you. And this is one of the best rules of improvisational comedy. It's called yes and. So yes means to be in agreement. Let's repeat that. Yes equals be in agreement. So we're going to be in agreement with wherever that person is at. The second part of that is and. Everybody repeat and for me. And. All right. So what we do with and is we add something to it. So when it came to Dolly, Kathy was in agreement with the fact that Dolly was waiting for somebody to come off that elevator. And at that point, she was in agreement and then she added something to it. What did she add to it? She asked that question, right? She asked that question of Dolly, what did your mom do? Oh my gosh, this could open up the floodgates for someone and a really great conversation. So that's pretty much it in a nutshell, and I think Chris, oh, oh, hold on. Okay, so Dr. Ragona, I do have, I've got lots to say. <laughs> Dr. Ragona brought up a really good point. He said one of the best ways to see somebody maybe come back a little bit from some severe dementia is to really get them social. What we feel is very strong about these four rules of improv that we use is that anyone can access them, and we have done this with children. And we feel it's very, very important that when we're trying to increase a socialization amongst our elders in the community, kids have to be part of our care partner team. Our little children, our grandchildren, those teenagers, 
But how do we do that? How do we encourage them to be part of our team? How do we encourage them to visit grandma more often or interact with her? What if they're scared, which a lot of them are. Older people can be scary. What if grandma says something so strange I don't know how to respond? Well, these four rules of improv are what are going to give a child of any age the confidence to be able to create that peak moment of success. That's what these do. They don't have to read a large manual. They don't have to watch a ton of movies about dementia. If we can teach them the four rules of improv and have fun with it at home and teach them these rules at home, they will build their confidence to be able to communicate with their grandparents or anyone within their community. And that is the way to increase that socialization, that exposure to other people in their community and keep the older people engaged and socializing. And I, I think we're at our time limit. We are. I'm getting the nod that we are at our time limit. <laughs> so definitely, if you have any more questions, we are in this, this table right here. We can uh, share some more information with you about uh, what we do. And you can go to DementiaRaw.com to find out more. Thank you. Thank you. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Dean and I'm from Great Lakes Clinical Trials and um, I think we've heard a lot today about Alzheimer's and it's uh, probably pretty disheartening for a lot of people to hear what, what the progression of the disease is and um, where we're going to go from here. Well, <clears throat> I'm here to offer some hope and we are in the process right now of studying three Alzheimer's drugs here in Chicago. We're on the north side of Chicago, on the corner of Foster and Ashton. Very easy to get to us. We, the, the drugs that we're studying don't only, they, they don't treat the symptoms like previous uh, Alzheimer's drugs. The drugs we're studying are designed to go after changing the course of the disease. In other words, slowing it down, stopping it, curing it. There's a whole new wave of medication that's on its way but we cannot get that medication without you. And I know that, that sounds pretty onerous, but it is. The only way any medication in this country or probably the world is ever uh, approved is through clinical trials. It's usually done with a placebo, which means half the people get the drug, half the people don't. We're in, state, we're in phases two and three in testing. There's four phases of, of clinical trials. The first phase is where they, uh, it's usually younger people come in and they run the drugs through them, they figure out what the dosage is, they're in the hospitals, it's very intense. And then they have a smaller group where they test it on people who have the disease, and then they expand it into uh, phase two and phase three where they're looking for you know, 1,000 people, 1,500 people who have the disease that they can test this new drug in. So this is where you come in. If any of you, I've, I've talked to some of you today already and you say, oh, clinical trials, I don't want to have anything to do with that. Right now, particip participating in a clinical trial is nothing like it used to be even 15 years ago. It's the most regulated aspect of medicine. We are completely governed by an institutional review board and the only reason that board is there is for your protection. You can come and you can, you can screen for a trial, you can enter a trial and at any point you get to say, I don't want to do this anymore. There's nothing hidden from you. You will come in. We will go over probably a 30-page document with you that will tell you everything that's going to go on in the trial, the side effects, the possible side effects. The, the, they, they will not, though, tell you that um, you're going to get a benefit from it. And the reason they can't tell you that yet is because they're in the process of testing it. But just rest assured, if, if you come into our clinic, that, that drug has already been tested. They're not there, we're not testing those drugs that really don't work. We have had some um, uh, pretty big challenges getting people into our clinic in who have Alzheimer's. We, do, we have about 15 trials running in other diseases. Those are pretty easy. And I think that there's an issue of shame that people have with memory loss. And there's another issue of their physicians are not telling them that they have Alzheimer's. Early, dete early detection and diagnosis is huge. 
The reason their physicians are not telling them is because often their family members don't want them to know it. Oh, grandma has memory loss. They don't want, they don't want the word dementia and they don't want the word Alzheimer's used. So I've, I do memory screens, we do, out in the community we do memory screens. And this happened to me about four times where people came in and I go, well, why are you here? Oh, I just want to get my memory checked. Well, what drugs are you on? And then, you know, I ask them, do you have any issues? And, no, none at all. Well, what drugs are you on? They list their drugs. They're on an Alzheimer's medication. And I ask them, well, why are you taking this medication? Oh, that one's for my memory. Then they, you know, then they, oh, well, that's for my memory. And I go, oh, okay. Those people are diagnosed with Alzheimer's and don't know it. And they're still viable. These people are still, they're, 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 they're still, you know, doing really well. Those are the people we need in, in clinical trials. We're looking for people who are at the very beginning of memory loss, if in fact your memory is affecting your daily life. You've you heard, you heard all of the uh, um, um, symptoms and stages of Alzheimer's from Dr. Ragona. There's, there's several stages of memory loss that all of us go through. Well, there's one, and that's age-associated memory impairment, AAMI. Every single person in this room has it. My brain's not as good as it was when I was 17, and yours isn't either. It's a normal part of aging. What's not normal is when you, it's, it's when you get to the stage that's called mild cognitive impairment. It's where you're not quite sure where you are, you're not quite sure what you did last week, you're not quite sure, you know, a big events, you forget them. That's not normal. I mean, you know, it's just not. And then the next stage is, is where they diagnose you with Alzheimer's. So here's the hope that there, is, uh, that there is out there for Alzheimer's, and it's a big hope because these drugs are amazing, it's the new frontier, is if you enter a clinical trial now, you will come to a, a, our, a clinic or a clinic, you're gonna get incredible medical care. Everything is free. You're going to be, you're going to be uh, seen by an internal medicine doctor, a neurologist, a psychologist, a uh, psychiatrist, any number of doctors, all free. If in fact you pass the initial screening, then we send you to a hospital in the local area where we'll, get, we'll, we'll do a PET scan on your brain. A PET scan is a, it's a relatively new uh, screening uh, tool that they use. It's like an incredible x-ray and we'll be able to tell what's going on in your brain. This is completely new. This is, the, this is helping the frontier of the drugs. Um, and often people, if you have the plaque and uh, towel buildup as, as he discussed earlier, we'll ask you to enter the trial. If you don't, nothing ventured, nothing, you have, you've, not, you've not lost anything. You've actually found out that we've had people who've had other issues in their brain that we found out that was causing them issues and it wasn't Alzheimer's. It, it's, the, it's the type of thing where people say, well, you know, I, I, I have Alzheimer's, but you know, I don't want, I don't want to enter a clinical trial. And my question is, well, what have you got to lose? You have not, really, I don't understand why you wouldn't do it. If my mother had it, I would drag her into a clinic. And I didn't know all this two years ago, by the way. I, I've, I've been doing this for about two years. I, didn't, I did not know that Alzheimer's was a deadly disease. It's the number six killer of people over, the 60, over 65. They die of Alzheimer's. Number six. And this group is the most affected by it. And it's this group right here that, is, that we really, really need in Alzheimer's research. So please, if you know anyone with early memory loss, if, it, if they're moderate to severe, there's not a lot of clinical trials going on for that. But if you know someone in the early stages of memory loss or someone who um, has, has just been diagnosed with Alzheimer's, please get in touch with us. We need you. It's relatively easy. You come to our clinic. The first visit, you show up on your own. If you enter the trial, we will send a car for you every time back and forth, and we will pay you to, to come to the clinic. There's a stipend for your time and effort. So that's about all I've got. I hope I covered most of it. So does anybody have any questions, or are you hungry? You're hungry. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I want to I thank you again 
Any questions that you want answered, you can see our panelists. Please do that, okay? You can ask them any questions. But again, I'm asking you all to continuously, if you have any concerns or any questions, please call me. We're going to be doing a whole lot of things in the community. I've been in this community for many, many years. And I've seen things that I don't like. And one of the things I don't like is that we don't take advantage of free, free things, okay? Now, if I had said you had to pay for it, then it would have been different. Everything here is education. Dementia and Alzheimer is some serious, serious stuff. I'm at the age where I think I might have a touch of it. <laughs> okay, I'm not sure, but because I know I forget all the time. And what I do is write notes. I write everything down. I say, oh, write that down, write that down. That's the only way I remember stuff is writing it down. And you don't have to be in your 60s to have to do that. Is that right, girls? <laughs> you, you can be in your 40s and have to write stuff down. It's been my pleasure and my honor to have you. This is just one of the many forms. Now take advantage of what you're, why you're here, okay? Talk to the vendors. You got the Diabetes Project here. You got El Marie over here with Blue Cross and Blue Shield. You've got the girls back here, the Mitchell girl, raw girls. <laughs> talk to them, those are the Mitchell raw girls. You need to talk to them. Then over there in the last corner, not the last, you got RXL. They are the sponsors of this event. So they thought enough for me to come to them and say, I want you to sponsor this. They're going to sponsor more events. But when I do the next one, I want this room overflowing. <laughs> overflowing with people, okay? Everybody in the community needs to know, okay? It's time to come out and get some education. They don't cost you nothing. You got all these churches. So you need to come to me and tell me some of the places you like us to come out to. Uh, and my friend Ricky, Ricky, I saw your hand. What? You, as, as you have spoken out, let me let, introduce myself. This because I've been part of this community for many, many years. I'm Ricky Williams, service coordinator for Evergreen Tower. My uh, colleague is Cherise Coins. We're from the north side of, uh, of the city, which is Evergreen Tower. Uh, I have some ladies that's sitting here in purple uh, from Lake Park Place that I spent 14 years with and as a social director. I want to thank Christine today because I, I don't know how we met, but however we met, I don't know if it was through networking or uh, whatever, but I appreciate that she had invited us here to uh, this forum. I want to let her know we have a bus. It's a small bus, but the next time we do have an event, we're going to bring some of our residents to your event. But I do want to say, and I have to say this, a lot of you are residents probably in walking distance. Some residents are not in walking distance. And as I have spoke to some of them, my ladies are sitting in purple over there in Lake Park. You need to get to your older man and find the, the, the leaders in your community. But your alderman is your leader, that he can get a bus to, to pick up people, to bring them to a forum like this. So you know somebody that knows somebody, but your alderman, you know, somebody can, con you can go directly to your alderman, and you should be able to do that and communicate. And get a bus, and they can go around at a certain time, whatever the form may be, where it may be, that they can pick up people and bring them to this, this type of event. Because this is a very important event. And this kind of information, as Christine says, does not get out in our community like it should as, as African Americans. We need this information, more information, and more forms like this for people to come out and talk about this. And we as African Americans, do not get enough information. We can't, you know, we, we can go back and talk about it, but it's nothing like coming and listening to it and, 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 and seeing it and feeling it for yourself because all of us have loved ones that is going through dementia. My mother had it too. And it, it's a horrible disease. But again, 
community leaders, go to your alderman, say, we need you to get us a bus. You know other people from different places in Bronzeville that, uh, hey, we can pick up here, we can pick up there. Even if it's no more than five people, you got a bus of maybe 20 people make it, to make it to a, a forum like this or a session. So I just needed to say that, Christine, and I will be also working with Christine in the future uh, because I love the, my community, and my community is all over the city of Chicago because I have worked all over the city of Chicago. And together, Christine and I, and my, my colleague maybe, too, in the future will work together so we can bring forms like this back into our community. Thank you. What I'd like to do now is, I'm sorry. Oh, my phone number is 312-966-6076. Again, 312-966-6076. Please call me. I'd like you to let me call me and let me know what you thought of the form. Because I have to report to XLRX. They want to know if this is something that's viable in this community, which it is. We're missing out on so much, guys. I don't know what, I can't even begin to tell you. There's a lot of things, and you all know me, and I've been doing these events for years. Because the next one that comes up will be the community breakfast, which McCormick Chamber will be sponsoring. And I do this twice a year, and you guys know that. Okay? We're going to have other events. We're going to have other conferences so you can hear about things and resources. We have churches galore. Where are they? They should send their members. We're missing out, guys. We got to get with it or else we'll be at the end like we always are. Okay? I want to thank my wonderful speakers. Give them a hand. My vendors, I'd like to thank you. Give, give them a hand. And my sponsor, and I'd like my colleague to come up here. His name is Howard. Howard, would you come up here a second, please? <laughs> Howard is, they're my sponsor. So what I'd like him to do is just give you a quick spill, again, about XLRX Pharmacy. Good afternoon. Um, thank you so much for coming. Um, as Brian went over uh, everything regarding with, with Alzheimer's, besides our delivery service for prescriptions, the the patients who need may need who have Alzheimer's, condiment supplies, have trouble malnutrition or bathroom safety, we can offer all, all of this. To Excel, to Excel RX rather. So, if there, if you have any needs, we can we, we can help you. Um, He's quiet. Yes, I'm not. I'm not much on speaking. Uh, I'm not much on speaking in, in, in large crowds. I don't, so again, thank you. But if you come by our little table over there, I can explain in, in greater detail. All right? Okay. All right. Thank you again. Stop by XR table. Please stop by XLRL. Got me saying it wrong. Excel RX table, which is over at the end. Pick up some information about this free home delivery service. It don't cost you nothing. They deliver your medication to you at your apartment, at your house, in your corner. We don't go to your car now. You gotta have a facility. <laughs> and we will bring out a part. I'm a part of what they do. I love this community, I always have. I was gone for a while, but I'm back. I'm here to die, right here, okay? This is where I'm dying, so I'm not going nowhere. So you can look for me all over the place. Put your hand down, I saw with your hand, okay, I saw. So, I want to thank Elaine in the back. She's from Holy Angels. She volunteered her time to come today. 
you got Greg, who's taking the video, which we're going to post everywhere. You got Carmen over there at the end. These people came and volunteered for me to help me make this a success. So what I'd like to do is have us have lunch. Uh, we got a fabulous lunch, and if you haven't met my chef, his name is Chef Kareen Roberts. He can cook, and if you've been to the community breakfasts, you know this guy can smoke girls and boys, okay? He smokes. First, I'd like, my, I'd like you all to go eat, please. Okay, okay I'm sure they're not going to complain. So I'm going to have my speakers go first, and then I'll start calling the tables, okay? And let's have lunch. Let's fellowship like you do in church, okay? Right. Talk to each other, and let's share information. My name is Christine Bowden, and you guys know I am the founder and president of McCormick Chamber of Commerce. I also work with Excel RX. Glad to have you. We're going to start with them. They're going to go first. Take